Hello again, everyone. Um, that was another fantastic set of papers. And I just really want to compliment Michael and Deborah for having put together such a, a really complimentary set of papers this morning. And both sections have, you know, worked really well with their own kind of, you know, sub thematic elements. And for me, this session, second session today, has been characterized by what I want to call the anxiety of abundance. How do we decide what and how much to encode? How do we process more data faster? What do we do with those data once we have them? And how do we stop the data becoming meaningless in their sheer vastness? Sarah highlights the importance of having strategies for decision making to think through how we make choices about what we include. With such a cornucopia of resources, how do we create strategies that enable us to have workable data sets, even if we do not have a fully comprehensive set of sources? Sarah's paper demonstrates some of the pluses and minuses of crowdsourcing in this regard. Communities give us access to more knowledge and faster, but we are dependent upon the interests of those community members to some extent. For me, her conclusion that we must both find ways to systematize our collection of data while also following the winds of research concerns is spot on. And I will circle back to that idea shortly. With optical musical recognition, the possibilities are amazing here. Um, and I'm really interested in knowing you know, what kind of work is going to be involved in, in extending that, teaching the computer to read Ars Nova notation, polyphony, how much of a challenge would the comparative complexity in rhythm create, and what about Ars Subtilio? We are offered both great possibilities and risk here. On the one hand, there is the potential to put more transcribed chant out into the world, making it more accessible to music students, researchers, and performers. On the other hand, do we risk discouraging users from developing a deep relationship with early notation? Now, the teaching comments in the first session implies that digitized manuscripts are mainly a positive phenomena, bringing us closer to those sources. However, I was reading recently about the, the publisher, Adam Matthew, who supplies many databases of source material. And, and they've recently developed a HTR, handwritten text recognition software, for their, their interface. And Rebecca Baxter, part of the editorial team there, remarks that having worked across the first three modules of the Colonial America, that's one of their source material modules, I know all too well how difficult some of these documents can be to read. Over the past years, I have given myself many a migraine, straining my eyes to decipher script that can sometimes be almost illegible. Yet, the relationship that Baxter must have developed with those documents must be a very close and special one. One that we all have experienced in reading and transcribing text and music from medieval manuscripts. So our fisherman moments give us that kind of really special relationship. Optical recognition is doubtless a step forward in our efforts to make medieval music more accessible, to democratize access. Yet, we must always be critical in how we make use of this technology and be aware of the evolution of our relationships with our source material. So I often think about how our interaction with digital sources and methods can in fact change our modes of thinking about the, the sources, the things that we're working with. In teaching the computer to recognize notation, for example, Jennifer, you explain that you have to break down the information very systematically because the computer cannot extrapolate those relationships the way a human mind can. In passing and systematizing our understanding of notation in this way, how has it changed your relationship to the notation and how you think about it? Are there ways in which your thinking about notation now seems alienated from what it was before? That is, are you now viewing notation in such a different way that you yourself are processing it somehow differently? And by contrast, are there ways in which you think this might better have led you to appreciate the medieval understanding of notation better? 
that is, by systematically breaking down notation for the computer, has it given you any insights into, say, how notation was developed or even taught or learnt in the medieval era? Now, Kate's paper focused on what we begin to do once we move past what she terms the hunter-gatherer phase. Once we have collected all, or at least a large portion, of chant data, and this, this really interests me. Jennifer talked about the importance of these data in establishing intertextual connections, something that really fascinates me. But, but what then? We may have identified a number of melodies that begin with the same pattern, for example, and we can publish papers on this. But to a certain extent, those who follow us to learn about chant and perhaps to become researchers themselves still have to reenact that process of discovery. And in some ways, that's great. We don't want to spoon feed the budding researcher, but we also want to clearly indicate the ground that has been trod before. Currently, when I'm looking at a section of chant, whether I'm looking at a section of chant on Cantus, or whether I'm looking at a textual refrain on something like the University of Exeter's Je Chante en Chant database, I'm not immediately aware of those intertextual relationships, nor if they have been researched in depth. Kate's analogy of the fishermen and oceanographers highlights the anxiety we feel with, with big data in any subject. Saeed Chowdhury, the Dean of Digital Research at the Johns Hopkins Libraries, has characterized big data as the point where data become overwhelming. I really like that idea. With something like the Sloan Digital Sky Project that I mentioned earlier, which captures images of galaxies and uses crowdsourcing to classify them, the point at which data become overwhelming means having over 500 million celestial objects captured in their database. Crowdsourcing, in this case, was one of the answers to that problem, allowing our amateur stargazers to join in with the game of differentiating a spiral galaxy from other different shapes. For those working in chant, this point of overload could be the moment in which we have to decide between being oceanographers or fishermen. And for many of us, it isn't a straightforward choice. We can't become oceanographers without first dipping our toes in those rock pools, right? This moment, movement between close and distant reading is a phenomenon that we often wrestle with um, in literary research as well. We can mine a million books in the Hutti Trust Library and identify trends across literature. But we must first learn to read and analyze a single poem before we can do this. Because unless we can do that, we cannot then appreciate the significance of broad literary trends in which that poem sits. And those broad trends would have no impact upon we, how we read the poem. So here I want to tie back into Sarah's paper in which she argues we need to think systematically about our data collection, while also being agile and responding to research needs. To understand broad trends, we need to have a well-balanced data sample, but without the impetus of individual research projects and the return to a very human fascination with a particular melody, the large-scale systematized data loses meaning. Added to these thoughts, I also wanted to note the importance of diversity issues here. Sometimes it is important to deep dive into particular sets of sources to redress an imbalance in what we have available to us. Sarah pointed out that manuscripts owned or created by women are currently underrepresented. And diversity is something that's being more tackled across the board in digital humanities these days. We've had criticisms of digital humanities being too white and too male. So, the push to make room for marginalized voices, whether this be female influence in chant, digitizing African-American newspapers of the 20th century, or holding symposiums on transgender spaces of expression on the internet, these are all kind of important points where we deep dive into particular areas of data. Kate's paper has really captured some of the exciting possibilities of what we can do with big data in chant how we face the seemingly overwhelming data, data deluge and start to tame it in such a way that we can better understand the grammar of compositional process. 
For me, this is an example where something that seems so alien to the medieval era, computational analysis, might in fact lead us to a better understanding of what was written. What melodic path was the mind of a medieval composer statistically more likely to follow? And what can that tell us about how a composer thought about their craft? And what can we learn from those anomalies where the, the system wouldn't use the low D, but the composer would? So that gets us to start thinking about how those minds were working in that process. What were the fingerprints of compositional identity? From an ocean of data, we can put a single rock ball back under the microscope and question how a single melody formed in a single mind. To return to Jennifer's comments on intertextuality, again, this is a moment where we are faced by big data, a huge network of connections, some not yet identified, some identified, and some both identified and written about. Now we need to think about how we build that data into our platforms and express larger scale interconnections. Because as our investigations of chant data continue, we are creating yet more data to become part of our digital platforms. And we have to start questioning how we meaningfully incorporate that. For example, do we create linked open data identifiers for data points in chant databases? so we can identify relationships between melodies and encode those relationships semantically. As someone who has worked on the medieval motet, I've spent a lot of time thinking about how interrelationships between motets can be codified in this way to allow students and researchers to better understand the interconnected web that these pieces create. But motets are, of course, for the most part, um, based upon snippets of plain chant. So to be able to create a semantic link between a database of motets and the database of chants from which their tenors are derived strikes me as being an extremely valuable exercise. So when we think of this, this big data deluge as a whole, I like to think about how we can get back to thinking about the interconnections which brought this data into being all of that history, all of that music, all of those people, how were they looking at the world? How were they, when someone was writing a chant in Paris, what were, what were the interconnections there? And how can we start to encode that on a database such that a researcher or a student can dip in and start to really step into that world? Let's welcome our speakers back up onto the stage to talk about this further. So yeah, there, <laughs> there was a lot to process in this second session. Um, I think uh, some of the things that stuck out the most to me were um, what Kate showed us where she ran all of this data through her chant bot and came up with these, <laughs> with these, uh, these, fa these uh, newly composed chants. Um, I'm wondering if, uh, with even more data run through that, if it could come up with something that might end up being more accurate and not starting on B flats, for instance. Um, I don't know. And also, uh, I think that that, uh, that what you talked about as well, Jennifer, with the um, optical recognition issues, that I think that these two things do go hand in hand um, somehow, and I think that, that if we find a way to link them up, that might be very fruitful. So, yeah. uh, addressing the, the question of, um, uh, you were talking about with the optical music recognition and the, and the relationship with the uh, notation and, and what happens when you start to do these things. I think one of the things that surprised me was actually just how many variations, for instance, those compound nooms, uh, because as, um, as a musician, as a chant scholar, you, you see those things and you just read them 
you know, we don't need to know that there are 29 different versions because if we just want to read them, we just read them. Mm -hmm. And so, uh, for me, it's fascinating that, you know, that, that, that kind of flexibility that the uh, scribes were really just seeing. They were just using this notational style in a very flexible way. Uh, and I think that's, uh, I think that's kind of fascinating. What we do with it, I, I don't know, but for this process, we have to actually acknowledge it, otherwise we miss them. Uh, because the, the computer just, if it doesn't know that it's supposed to look for this thing, it says it's something else. Um, so I think that's, that's really important. So the point at which data becomes overwhelming. I like that a lot. Um, and I think I reached that point about a year out of submitting my dissertation. At which point this was all in my head. I mean, I, um, uh, you know, if, if you have to do that and pour over manuscripts and do a bunch of transcriptions and things like that, you think like, why couldn't a computer do this? We have handwriting recognition technology, what's wrong here? And I literally, I mean, I used to like bug my husband who's a computer guy and I was like, why can't you get one of your handwriting technology people to help me here? Um, and, and of course they're linked, right? Like if we get a million chance recognized using OMR, um, then we can throw them all into large databases and, um, and start recreating a, a medieval musical atmosphere, which still is kind of uh, lost or, or, or inaccessible, or at least accessible only in pieces. And I think the only thing other that I would say about this like sort of data becoming overwhelming thing, um, uh, you sit here and you look out and there's light and there's the air system and there's my thoughts and there's every observance that I have here and there's all the sensory apparatus going on in my body and somehow my brain is telling me to say a sentence that makes some sense. I'm doing a whole bunch of kind of decision making and, and honing down as I go to kind of operate as a human. And I think in musical terms, um, if you are, I mean, if you're aware of this idea of this, of this overwhelming amount of data, uh, you're kind of paralyzed, but if you start finding ways to move within it and to, and to reference things that seem common, um, then you can do things like behave like a me medieval musical mind, um, making decisions that make some sense in this overwhelming amount of data that we don't actually take seriously anymore because we've sort of found a path. Um, in the same way as we do with our brains all the time. So, that's what I would say. We have a question from the back. Anna, yeah. Hello, I'm Anna from RIT, and I have a question to Jennifer. So, uh, I found your job wonderful. The system works very good from what I've seen. My question is, is there a possibility to eliminate the stage of uh, binarization, since you told that in case of variant contrast, you can lose some characters or, I mean, the... Yeah. Um, the, so I, I'm not one of the technology people. They are all at McGill. Um, and, but my understanding of that process is that the binarization is um, critical for the computer to actually recognize the musical content on the page. Um, that the computer needs it to be binarized in order to read it. Um, and then the removal of the staff lines helps it to recognize the, the individual musical shapes. The problem then is when you put the staff lines back, it, it's, it's, it's about really the, the layout of the page that a lot of digitized images, often these are big books, and so um, the, even if the staff lines were drawn completely straight, and a lot of times they are, occasionally they're not, but even if they are, if the image is of an open book, there's sometimes a curve to the staff line in the image. And so then when we put straight staff lines back on top of them, the names don't show up in the correct place. Um, so that's something that I think needs to be worked out in, in a technical way, and I don't know what that answer is to, but my understanding is that binar binarization is, is, for this process, seems to be the, the first step that, that you have to do, so. Yeah, I was just asking because, you know, uh, if we compare to optical character recognition, 
uh, there is already a way to solve this problem without uh, going to recognize text without doing binarization. Right, in optical character recognition, yes. yeah. Um, well, we should tell it and Andrew. <laughs> um, uh, if there's some literature that you could point us to that we could send them to, that would be fabulous. Thanks. Yep. They actually tried to do it with color um, for about three months with the Hardcore stuff. Um, and it was, uh, you saw an image at some point go up and the difference between the brown ink on the page and the background of the manuscript uh, was problematic and they couldn't get the the settings right to try to do uh, feature identification on a non-binarized thing, on, on something that still retains some color. And they also did some like UV light or something. Like, there was a, there's some sort of artificial lighting that they tried to put it through to see if that would work and it didn't. So binarization seemed to be the way to go. I wanted to return to Jennifer, um, your response to, to Hampson and the question of does looking at so, at looking at this notation, you know, after the binarization process and then trying to classify and correct, does it, does it, um, do you relate then to the medieval notation somewhat differently or differently? And I wanted to add to that, as, as you were speaking, it made me think about, I can't remember your wording, but it was really beautiful the way you described sort of the vagaries of the hand and how, you know, when we go to process that medieval notation ourselves, we can somehow assimilate the vagaries of the medieval hand on the page without having to um, do what the computer does, that the computer finds it really hard. And, and it made me think that there's a way in which um, somehow this process actually makes us more aware of the materiality of the medieval writing process and that in a way it's a competition or it's a it's a problem between mediums like the compute the medium of computer and whatnot is such a different medium than the medium of the hand on parchment and yeah. and so um I, I guess i was just i was just excited by that that idea that mm -hmm. it could draw us more closely into the materiality even though it feels as if it should be making it seem more abstract it actually um, could actually make us more aware of the materiality of the process yeah and perhaps also of human cognition, right? Yeah. That um, uh, I've just started reading a book by Daniel Levitin called The Organized Mind, and it is all about that idea of how our minds actually categorize and, and think about these things and how we draw relationships and, and similarity um, between things. And with the, with the notation, we are really thinking about shapes and that you know shapes go with like shapes. But in fact, the way we process things is much more, um, it seems to be much more contextual or functional. Con I think conceptual is the way that he described it rather than perceptual. But the way that we have to teach the computer is through perception of the shapes and the relationship between the shapes. That kind of reminds me a, a little bit of um, working with, with one particular manuscript where I was transcribing it and for the text encoding initiative. And this particular scribe, when he ever came to the French word for heart, cœur, he actually drew a little heart instead of, of writing the word. And if I'd been transcribing for um, a paper edition, I probably would have just written cœur and carried on and, and maybe not even made a footnote because it was something that was fairly self-evident, but using the TEI, I was like, well, I've got so many more options here. So perhaps I can find out if there's a way to indicate that this was a symbol, and there was. And through going through that whole process, I just felt like I had a completely different relationship to that manuscript. Mm -hmm. I suddenly started to think more about this scribe versus the, the other scribe in, in the manuscript didn't use the, the little heart symbol. So, you know, yeah, yeah, the emojis <laughs> grow, exactly. <laughs> <laughs> I just I like that extra process of going through those steps yeah. of, of making those choices about encoding kind of just brought me closer to that, to that manuscript. Yeah. Yeah. Any more questions? We want to thank everyone today. This has been very enriching and illuminating uh, for, for the field. Um, thanks to Deborah and to Jennifer for 
for bringing together this, this group. Um, and it will live on not only Twitter, but we'll have video of this for our colleagues that, that missed the live stream this morning and weren't able to join. Um, we're going to dismiss to the, to a, the Wegmans Family ga Gallery, which is out to the left, um, through the new hall. Thanks, Paul. <laughs>